Welcome to The Accidental Trainer, a podcast where you'll hear firsthand stories and tips on how to start and grow your training career. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of ATD Accidental Trainer Podcast. I'm your host, Alexandria Clapp, and today we have with us Lauren Weinstein. Hi, Lauren. Hey there. How's it going? Good. Lauren is the co-author of the Empowered Job Search and the Career Discovery Lead at Microsoft. And the reason I asked Lauren to join us today is I'm really excited to talk a little bit about some career dev related topics. So I discovered you, I think a few years ago, I'm so excited that we finally got to start talking this year. And I know there's just been so many layoffs happening this year. And I just thought you'd be a great person to help us navigate all, just all, all sorts of things that have been happening in the, the job environment. So with that, I think maybe a good place to start is your career story and telling us a little bit about your origin story. So how did you land in your role that you're in today? What was accidental and purposeful? Sure thing. And thanks so much for having me on the podcast. You know, I think I started out in my early in my career, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I stumbled into management consulting. I was a competitive swimmer in college. And I, I really, I spent so much time underwater that I just didn't really know what was out there. And so I think part of my story is figuring out what I want to do. And it's definitely been a process. <laughs> um, and um, I would say that, um, you know, I started out in management consulting and I felt like I was placed in like health and life sciences and technology consulting. And I kind of felt like, wait, how did I, how did I get here? And I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out where are my people? Where's the work I want to do? And was really intentional about moving early in my career into uh, corporate social responsibility and international development. And that's kind of been a through line, I would say, as I look back on some of the kind of career decisions I've taken, recognizing when things are working and recognizing when things aren't working, and then being really intentional about making shifts or transitions. And so, for example, at Accenture, you know, I ended up, you know, getting really into eventually coaching. Um, and I I was trying to get what I wanted inside Accenture. And I ended up doing an external leadership coaching program at Georgetown about 10 years ago. And then I, I, I kind of have, have moved my career towards the talent leadership coaching space. But at different times, I've kind of recognized these moments when things are working and things aren't. And, and then I'll just give one more example is, you know, I was working on my own after I left Accenture um, for about a year and a half as an independent consultant and coach. And there were so many parts of it that I loved and was thriving in. <laughs> I was thriving. And at the same time, I really realized I missed working in a team and I wanted to be part of something bigger. And I ended up joining a family foundation where I became uh, kind of the in house career coach for a network of individuals around the globe to help support them in their career development and their career journeys. Well, uh, so I was taking notes, but you talked about recognizing when things were working versus not and being intentional about transitions. So mm -hmm. before we talk about your current role, I'm curious if you can help describe a little bit more about that. What does that mean to recognize when things are working or not? Yeah, I think it's definitely taking a look in the mirror and confronting uh, the reality. I remember early on, I, I think I discovered the quarter life crisis term and theme before it became a, a hot topic. Um, and I remember reading a book about the quarter life crisis and starting to do all these self-reflection exercises and working with a coach. I think I was uh, maybe 23. <laughs> and, you know, I think it was a lot of self-reflection. I think there's also a part of self-education. Um, when I got into even corporate social responsibility and international development, I started reading a ton. I picked like 10 books that I wanted to read. And just to kind of see what was piquing my interest, how could I use that as a way to gauge what I liked, what I didn't like? You know, and I, I also built lots of networks or communities, I went to tons of conferences. And so I think it's taking a look at, you know, what's working well, not just in your career, but in your personal life and trying to balance the trade-offs. That's a little bit of an idea. 
Yeah. And I guess that's connected to, or is that different than your process for creating intentional transitions? I would say that the intentional transitions have just been, it's kind of the, my process for whether it's looking inside where you currently are in your organization and finding opportunities where you can, you know, flex your skills and, you know, build, build a career or build just even your next, your next job to get the skills and experiences you want or considering whether you want to leave and what that, what that looks like. But I really encourage people, especially people that I've coached in the past, always look within before you look outside because sometimes there are opportunities that you can carve out inside your current, current organization. And it takes a lot of work. Um, when I've pivoted, even inside Accenture, you know, it's taken a lot of time and you have to have a lot of patience. And at some point when it isn't working, it's recognizing that, hey, I want to do something else. And what's my process for defining that transition to something outside of where I currently am? I remember seeing this terminology boomerang employee for folks who quickly left their organizations during the great reshuffle resignation era and then realized the grass was not greener on the other side and wanted to go back to the organization that they were at. So I like that uh, recommendation of maybe not jumping ship too quickly before exploring some different options that you have where you already are at. Yeah. And I I appreciate and respect people who are boomerangs. And I think they realize that it was what what they had going on was working. But I also think about it in terms of like, you know, if you have an ex (laughs) that you've dated and you want to go back to and you kind of know what you're getting into. And I think the question is, is that what you want? And you are you comfortable in that? Or sometimes I think finding something new involves taking a lot of risk and effort to get there. And sometimes it is easier to boomerang. And sometimes it's a really intentional process to decide I want to return back to a place where I worked because actually that outside experience made you recognize that you really thrive in that environment. Yeah. Or there's like certain conditions that will be in place that will help you go back to a thriving environment as well. Okay. So I feel like we're already jumping into all sorts of meaty things. I cannot help it. I just uh, loved hearing you talk about the work that you do and you're a great storyteller. So I'm, I know that we'll get a chance to talk about maybe your book and all sorts of things today. But can you tell us a little bit about your role that you're doing in Microsoft now? Because you, as you said, you've, um, it's taken you a while to, to carve out this intentional path to be in the L&D space and talent management space. And you're doing some career dev things in your role now. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think maybe about five years ago, I was working in a professional services firm. I was doing executive recruiting for nonprofits, hiring executive directors and working with boards and search committees. And I was feeling like, it wasn't exactly where I wanted to be. I, I kind of had this realization. I I wanted to do more leadership development and learning and development. I knew mostly what that looked like, <laughs> but um, I decided to take one of those intentional transitions. And I, I ended up discovering this program, the Penn CLO program, the Chief Learning Officer program. At the, it's at the Grad School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was a very intentional decision to, to do that program. Um, and I'll just say that for years before I'd considered an MBA, an MPP, an MPH, <laughs> you know, I looked at all the different graduate degrees and nothing really clicked. And that, that program, I love the blend of leadership, development, technology, learning, research. And it really, I think, catalyzed this part of my career, which I'll talk about kind of how I've landed at, at Microsoft. Um, But I discovered through that program that I really wanted to work at the intersection of learning and technology. And a couple of months into that program, I moved from the social sector where I'd I'd spent about 10 years working in different capacities, strategy, consulting, some leadership development, some coaching. And I got this kind of dream job at Degreed, a learning tech company that was doing great work around learning experiences and supporting people through technology and through their product. And I was heading up learning and development and eventually moved over to leadership development. And I'll say that, you know, I, I actually got laid off last summer 
And, you know, it was one of those moments where I can really empathize with the experience. And I'm happy to talk more about kind of layoffs and how that relates to some of the research that I'm doing now in my doctorate of education program through Penn. But that was kind of a moment where it was another reset for me. And I found this great job inside Microsoft working in the global sales organization. It's called Microsoft Customer and Partner Solutions, MCAPS, inside their MCAPS Academy, which is their training academy, getting to focus on career development, leadership development, coaching, all these different elements that really energize and excite me. So my role right now inside Microsoft is really to support employees inside the global sales organization navigate the sales organization and discover what their interests are, how to flex their their skills and build the experiences they want to really thrive and grow in their career in whatever way works for them. And I'll just have to say that I take a broad view of career development. I think sometimes people like to box career development, leadership development, management development, leadership development in different categories for the sake of clarity of role definition, but these things all bleed into each other. So for me, career development is learning and growing all the time. It's not a one-time event. It's basically on an ongoing process to listen to what you need and to and what you need and want and to figure out how to achieve your personal and professional goals. So it's really about what we do each and every day to do our best work and discover something new about ourselves. Yeah, I'm thinking of so many things as you're describing that. And like, it's like lifelong learning and sort of like operationalizing that maybe to help create the conditions for your your employees that you're supporting. Have you heard of the term everboarding? I have not, no. I feel like it's sort of a buzzy word that I I, I think we got to get you and like Amber Watts together talking about it because uh, maybe you guys are very aligned and just using different terminology to mean the, a similar thing in terms of like having this ongoing opportunities to l- learn and grow in your organization. So, you know, on, if onboarding is just, and there's this connotation that it's uh, maybe the first few weeks of your role and then you're done and then you're ready, which <laughs> I love that. I love that. Concept hopefully isn't that. the case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, that'll be maybe on your to-do list for, for later for you guys to chat. I, I bet it would be an interesting conversation. Okay. As you can see, I just get so excited and jump all over the place. I'm already like ignoring some of my notes here, but you've been doing a great job of helping. I wrote down for myself, career development can be f- a fuzzy term. And you did a great job of describing what that means for you and your role and your work. And I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier. One of the reasons that I reached out to you is is as I'm thinking about it's December and it's a great time for people to be goal setting and thinking about priorities or strategy maybe for next year. Um, A lot of people take off some time around this year. So whether or not you are or people around you are, uh, things can sometimes be a little bit quieter uh, in your workplace environment. Maybe there's an opportunity to reflect. And maybe maybe not. Maybe you're someone who has been impacted by all of these massive... There's just been like a record-breaking amount of layoffs, especially in the tech industries that have happened this year. And I just felt like it would be excellent to have someone like you to help us navigate this time where maybe you're, we're producing less, we have an opportunity to think about ourselves and what what your thoughts are on this. So I don't know if it makes sense for us to jump into talking a little bit about your research, which sounds so, so cool. What do you think? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about um, some of my research, and then I can talk about the the book that I co-authored as well, and how it relates to navigating you know, the ups and downs and the emotions of the job search. Um, but yeah. yeah, I just want to say that it's being laid off, even restructured. It's so raw, right? There's so many emotions and complicated feelings about you know your own self worth and value, and that can really affect you know, how you see yourself and even how you interact with others during this time, you might be embarrassed or feel ashamed. 
um, you know, of something that happened at work and maybe don't want to talk about, you know, what's happening happening for you professionally or personally, right? Depending what's happening in your life. Um, but there can be sometimes a lot of pressure at this time with holiday parties and family time to kind of put on a good face or people trying to influence you about what you should do next or how you should be in this moment. And it's really hard. So I think I just want to say that for depending on your orientation, depending on what you've been through this past year, whether it's a layoff or a new job or restructuring or a difficult boss, um, or you've had a great year and it's a moment to celebrate, I think it's an opportunity to take some rest, you know, or some respite and do some reflection and reflect on what worked well, what didn't, what's next for you, what you might want to shift inside, what maybe can continue to stay the same. And another thing I'll say is just protecting your energy and making sure that you spend it where you want and making sure that, you know, if you're all of a sudden pulled into something that's big family event and you really need to just sit alone in a room or read a book how can you navigate those conversations and decide what would be most helpful for you in the moment? And I could talk a little bit about my research too and how this might relate. Right now, um, I mentioned I'm in um, a part-time doctoral program and my current research is really focused on the intersection of organizational change and what I call career shocks, <laughs> the unexpected events in people's careers. So there's been a lot of research on self-directed careers and how we can choose work that really aligns to our values, but less so of the role of the unexpected events that happen in our career. And as you mentioned, um, this year, there's been so many layoffs, so much change. And so I'm interviewing people who've been affected by organizational change and restructuring, like being moved to a new team, who have a new boss, who have you know, different, a, a different team structure, but I'm not necessarily focused on people who have been laid off. But I'm really curious about how people deal with unexpected career events and what makes them able to rebound or navigate them more easily. And so some of the research that I've done already really points to a few different personal attributes like locus of control, that's whether you perceive things are in your control or they aren't. Optimism, your ability to be openness to change and how open to change you are. Your career resilience, you know, your ability to deal with unexpected events in the past. Your own self-esteem and also the support structures that exist around you. So I'm early on in my research. And so maybe in about a, a year, I'll have a lot more insights to share with you. But I do think that for a lot of people work and identity their identity is so wrapped up in work and people have a hard time separating this experience from who they are and so these events feel very personal and i really want to help people feel more empowered around their ability to navigate these these big change events and feel like they're landing in a place that is helping them and benefiting them in their career yeah, gosh, I know you mentioned that you have over 30 of these interviews to conduct. And it just, yeah, it struck me because as we've talked about whether whether or not you've been impacted by a, a layoff, like there's there's often like some restructuring that happens in your organization if people have been laid off, or maybe it's like a merger situation. Um, and I think it's interesting to think of how how to empower people. How can they think of that um, as an opportunity where you're maybe suddenly being told that your your role is changing? So is that is it? Um, your research includes people who have been told, okay, this is your new role. Yeah. So it's a it's a mix of people, but I would say for the most part, for the most part, people are told that yeah, hey, this is your new role. There's, there's no choice necessarily in it. Maybe there's some ways to shape it, but then how do people respond to that? How do they cope with it? And what do they do with it? And how does that affect the way that they see their career goals shifting or changing because of that event? Now, some people I'm interviewing may be part of that change process. And I, I do think the research shows that you know if you're a manager and you're being pulled, like you're the one who has to share the news of the reorg or the 
you know, the, the organizational change, but you're also being affected by it. And that's really difficult because you have to balance this like, hey, I'm the messenger. And also like, this is really crappy for me and my work. Um, or you might be happy about it. So there are people who are involved in the change process who are, I, I am interviewing. And at the same time, their role is shifting or changing in some way that might be changing the way that they see themselves and their career opportunities. What do you think L&D's role is in this type of situation? Or do, does an L&D professional have a role? Yeah, it's a great question. There's a lot of turnover that happens because people aren't satisfied with their work and they've experienced some type of career shock, but they don't necessarily have the skills to navigate it. And I think for L&D, there's an important role to play around skill building. And some of that is like building resilience, you know, building sense of self and even leaning into how can people have the right mindset to deal with unexpected change. And sometimes this blends in HR or talent or even organizational development or organizational behavior type groups. So it really depends also what your remit is and how you can influence the system. But I do think there's a role both around like how, what are the skills needed to navigate these unexpected change to support people so they're more prepared and more able to thrive when this happens. Also looking at career career development as a topic in general? How do you support ongoing career conversations so people feel like they're supported and they're, you're, you've created a culture around career where people also feel like they're able to do their best work? And then I'll say like maybe lastly that a lot of people's experiences, and this is coming up in some of the interviews I'm doing, is that so much of your experience of an organizational restructure has to do with how your manager handles it or how they support you or how you feel supported. And so L&D has a role to play around manager development and blending how do you hold space for employees when there's high emotions, there's highly charged emotions around the topic. And I'll just give an example. When I was at Degreed, we, there were a bunch of layoffs and my boss, who was the head of people, asked me on the way out... <laughs> Hey, Lauren, can you lead workshops for people who've been laid off to help them land their next thing? I know you wrote this book, The Empowered Job Search, and so there's lots of content you could share. And can you also lead workshops for people who are staying? Because they need the space to process. They feel all Mm -hmm. kinds of complicated feelings about staying, but we also need to provide them with the tools and resources to rebuild and, you know, help maintain the culture and the work that we're doing here. So I ended up leading workshops for both people who were staying with another colleague who was staying and then also workshops for people who were leaving um, so that people felt supported all around. And I think there's a lot more space for us to be creative as L&D professionals to do that. Wow. There's a lot there. I'm trying to put myself in the place of maybe an L&D professional where, okay, I want to support my managers um, so that they can support this environment and this culture where people are leaving and people are staying. And I guess that goes to like, then what are the types, uh, the type of work that you do in like manager development? And it you mentioned some things before that I think probably makes sense in this context as well. The like, resilience and mindset. Um, some of that could be part of the the manager development training, or are there other different skills um, in terms of what makes a manager well equipped to handle these high stakes, a lot of range of emotions happening and creating this safe space of trust and like maintaining a culture that doesn't just like fall apart. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of it also is foundational, like empathy skills, relational skills, people might say emotional intelligence, right? And I think there's also just a role in bringing people together in community. And I think a lot of, you know, learning or training programs bring people together in a way that helps them actually just have open space to talk and connect and navigate what's happening. So that's a that's a piece of it. Um, I think we often put a lot of pressure on our managers to do a lot and to hold a lot of space. So 
I think there's also just also an, an acknowledgement that like we need to we need to provide space for managers too, not just for mm-hmm. them to help others, but for them to help themselves because it sometimes feels like that can be overlooked. Yeah. And what you were talking about also made me think sometimes it's just about like providing transparency when you're in this community space that you're they're offering. Um, even if they don't have like the answers, sometimes just that um, candidness and transparency of like, I we're going to navigate this together. I'm not sure what this means either yet, but we'll do it together can be reassuring enough, like just something like that. Yeah. And it really depends on the culture of the organization and the leadership, right? Because sometimes there's it can be hard to know what is actually happening in that moment when there is restructuring or there are layoffs, people can't talk about it or it's secretive. And so, you know, I guess I come at it from a more ideal, like I, <laughs> ideal scenario and I am optimistic around what's possible. But once, once there is more information out there, as you say, like a more of a transparent environment, talking about it and, and having leaders model that behavior more openly can really help people kind of navigate the emotions and cope with it in the moment. I think I see people who've been restructured or especially laid off, you know, three months, six months, a year later, you know, what I, what I kind of describe in the, the, the empowered job search is you know, this idea of work trauma. I know trauma can be a triggering word for a lot of people, but essentially what I, what I mean is that you've had this experience at work it could look, it could be that you keep, you've been restructured, you have have five new managers in the last two years. And so you feel like everybody, like you don't feel supported. <laughs> and that's a feeling that you have. And it kind of, you carry it with you into the future, into how you decide what you want to do next, whether it's staying inside that organization or you're going to a new organization and you're interviewing and you're just hyper-focused on that issue, that thing that you really feel burned about. So I just wanted to call out, uh, you wrote a book called yes. The Empowered Job Search, and we'll make sure we share that in the show notes. I ha- you're, It's just a great segue. We're talking about some of these topics that you cover. I know for myself, like one of the reasons I think that this, you, you stand out to me is just that you address um, the complex range of emotions, like the things that we've been talking about uh, associated with job searching. And I think I gave you the example, you know, I had a friend who was talking about how they've been applying to jobs and haven't had any human interaction yet. And it can feel like, it can just feel sad or like you feel a little bit defeated or down. You're like, I'm just uh, submitting my resume to this um, machine and it's just technology and it can be it can be a lot of emotions. Um, I know you have recommendations for how you navigate that. Can you talk a little bit about what's in your book and how that could be useful for anyone who is in search of a new career opportunity right now? Sure. Yeah. And I wanted to mention that I co-authored the book with um, Kathy Wasserman, who's a really talented career coach. And we partnered on some work together, designing a career leadership program at a family foundation that evolved over time. And and she her orientation is really around nonviolent communication. And so she kind of introduced me to some of this, this language and the notion of feelings and needs and working with feelings and needs in the context of the job search. And so in our lots of conversations together and I don't want to say how many hundreds and hundreds of hours later, co-authoring a book. You know, we 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 felt like emotions and navigating emotions is probably the most important aspect of navigating the job search, and it's missing in so many books about finding a new job. And so we focused a lot on, you know, what are the common emotions in the job search, both positive and negative emotions. And in the book, we talk a bit about like an emotional breakthrough process. How do you discover the underlying, you know, needs that you have or or limiting or empowering beliefs that might influence you to take action in a certain way? So for example, you know, if you're really anxious about your work and as a coping strategy, you just keep applying to jobs, but you really don't have a direction, it's not really serving you well. Or if you're feeling a lot of fear and you feel blocked, like you have a writer's block, but for jobs, you can get in the way of yourself. So what do you do when you're feeling these these big emotions 
And as you mentioned with your friend, like when you're applying to jobs and you don't hear back, you can start to question, is there something wrong with me? Like, is it me? (laughs) And sometimes you just need the validation of, you know, kind of your unmet need of feeling validated. And you might need to call up five friends and say, hey, I need you to tell me like five things I'm awesome at because I need to feel like I'm worthy. Um, so we we kind of share some of these ideas and strategies, but so much of it is personal around, you know, what do you need to lean into to get the validation, to, you know, find some of the joy and excitement of what it actually means to look for something new. Because we we really believe that finding a new job can be one of the most important learning experiences, but often <laughs> the way that it's structured today and the competitiveness and the market, it can feel like the most painful process. Well, those are really nice recommendations that I think anyone listening could apply or recommend or be that person to be like, hey, here's five great things about you <laughs> and you're very worthy. So I love that. I'll just add one other thing, which is that there's, you know, I think getting really clear on your unique value and what you, what type of work you want to do, what makes you energized, excited, invigorated, you know, and and then combined with having some daily practices, morning practices, evening practices that either acknowledges your feelings and needs or helps you stay more grounded or helps you stay on track. You know, there's, this is a moment in time where you can kind of also reflect on like, again, what's working, what isn't, and what structures you need to set up for yourself. And that could include people in your life that could include the type of work you're doing. There's just so many ways to, to look at it. And I, I really, really appreciate having the, the opportunity to, to share some ideas and thoughts with you today. So thank you again. Yeah, of course. Gosh, I know we're barely just scratching the surface. And I hope that folks just realized you have all this great knowledge about all sorts of things. And so that's why I wanted to make sure we touched a little bit on your research, touched a little bit on your book, um, talked a little bit about like the work that you're doing now. I am just excited to see what's to come. And, you know, mentioning that program that you're part of, because maybe there's folks listening who are like, hey, I might need to check that out for myself because I also can't seem to find the right next, I don't know, educational experience that is aligning with my goals. So I think you just have a really cool career story background. And I'm imagining that it's going to be really inspirational for our ATD community. So let's focus back on you a little bit right now. Can you tell us what your learning goals are currently? Yes. Well, as a full-time employee, a parent part-time doctoral student and expecting mother. (laughs) I have a lot on my plate right now. So I think my focus is mostly on, you know, working towards my dissertation over the next year, thriving at work and taking moments of of just reflection and opportunity to to learn from the the projects and programs I'm designing and shipping. And I definitely need to revisit how to take care of newborns. And and cope and parenting strategies for you know five and a half year olds. So I'm definitely in it, <laughs> and uh, just to make sure that I can continue to, you know, do my best as a parent, as a partner, um, as an employee. It's it's a lot to balance, but I have a good support network. Thank goodness. Yeah. Well, gosh, you're you're in a great place right now. I'm grateful that you were. Uh, available and interested to spend some time with us this af- this morning. Um, where can folks keep up with you, find you, your activity if they want to learn more or see what you're up to? Yeah, the I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I post when I get inspired. Um, you can follow me and uh, our website, theempoweredjobsearch.com has more information about the book. So I would say those are the best ways to connect at the moment. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. It was such a pleasure to chat with you today. Yeah. Thanks again for having me.